I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine. And we analyse the news that the US House of Representatives is soon to vote on the Israel and Ukraine aid bills. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 16th of April, two years and 52 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So over the last 24 hours, Russia has targeted a total of 13 Ukrainian oblasts. Uh, I was going to list them all by the areas, but it's basically it's easier to say the regions that were not hit. And they're essentially just those in the extreme west to the northwest bordering Poland and to the slightly further south bordering Romania. There's widespread destruction across the rest of the country, but civilian deaths and injuries um, seem minimal, thankfully. Only reported in Herzon, Kharkiv, Krasnorivka and Donetsk oblasts. Ukrainian air defence units say they intercepted all nine Russian drones that were fired overnight towards Hezon, Mikolaev, Kamenitsky, Poltava, Chikazy and Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, no casualties reported because of those drones. Uh, Russian forces, however, do seem to have made have made recently confirmed advances near Siversk. That's to the north east of Bakhmut, um, around Avdivka and the west, generally in the west of Donetsk city. Now, there is no doubt Russian forces are exploiting the depleted uh, Ukrainian munition situation, with even President Zelensky saying in an interview with PBS NewsHour that's published today, he said Russia destroyed the Tripilia thermal power plant near Kyiv a few days ago because Ukraine had run out of missiles to defend the plant. He said Russia launched 11 missiles at the thermal power plant, And although Ukraine was able to shoot down the first seven, the other four got through and destroyed Tripilia. Why, Zelensky asked, because there were zero missiles. We have run out of all the missiles that protected the Tripilia TPP, the thermal power plant. But as an indication of how chaotic the front is right now, and to underline the idea that Russia is mostly advancing because of the weight of numbers and a very low moral bar to how they use them, plus Ukraine's ammunition shortage. Geolocated footage published on Sunday, just I've just uh, caught up with, indicates that Ukrainian forces have regained positions in southwestern Novomikhailivka, that's southwest of Donetsk City. Additional geolocated fo- footage published over the last couple of days does show Russian forces have advanced southeast of Krasnorivka, that's west of Donetsk, and in northwestern Pobieda. That's uh, that's uh, near south, uh, just the southwest of Donetsk City as well. So, you know, it's still mostly going in, in Russia's direction, but minimal and largely because there's about, well, depending where you get stats from at the moment, it's reported to be five, six or seven to one advantage in the amount of artillery being fired Russia versus Ukraine. Now, connected to all this, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence directorate, Mr. Chuckles, Lieutenant General uh, Karoly Badanov, He said Ukrainian forces are preparing to repel a future Russian major offensive expected, he says, in late May or the beginning of June. But he noted that this will be, quote, catastrophically difficult, unquote, without Western military assistance. And then Ukraine's defence minister, Rustem Amerov, speaking on Sunday, said the current situation in eastern Ukraine is tense. uh, And and said that Russian forces are focusing their efforts west to Bakhmut towards Chasiv Yar. He said Ukrainian forces are successfully using modern technology against Russia's larger quantities of personnel, which is just as well, I reckon, because spokesperson for the Ukrainian Koritsia group of forces, Lieutenant Colonel Nazar Voloshin, uh, speaking yesterday, said Ukrainian forces in the Bakhmut and Avdivka areas can only use one to five artillery shells for every 10 
shells that Russian forces are firing. However, he's saying that Ukrainian artillery is much more precise. Now, Defence Minister Umerov may be trumpeting Ukraine's superior modern technology, but some of his drone operators speaking to the Washington Post in an article published over the weekend said that um, quite a number of drones that both Russia and Ukrainian forces are using have made the battlefield almost transparent. They say Russian forces have significantly increased electronic warfare jamming since last year. This idea of it being almost transparent chimed with me because I when I interviewed uh, Roman Kostenko, the former SBU commander, he was talking about how FPV drones, first-person view drones, have basically produced a gap of about four kilometres between warring forces or in, in, able to, in order to mount any kind of coherent mechanised assault um, other than just sort of dashing in. He said anything that moves within sort of 4Ks of the enemy lines is just hit by FPV. FPV. He said it's virtually not possible. Virtually no armoured assault was possible because of the drones. Now, these Ukrainian drone operators speaking to the Washington Post was talking about, in terms of the in terms of the density, I thought this was an interesting stat. They said there'd typically be about 100 drones from both sides in a 10-kilometre radius. So, you know, pretty busy piece of real estate. And think about what it's, uh, or airspace rather, think about what it's doing to the electromagnetic spectrum. And Russia targets operators, as in the pil- pilots, if we can, do we call them that, pilots, or, or drone operators, with glide bomb and MLRS, multiple launch rocket system strikes, specifically because they are so, so effective. Um, one Ukrainian drone instructor and a brigade commander said Russia is rapidly developing drones that operate on a wider range of frequencies to make it more difficult for Ukrainian electronic warfare systems to bring them down. And the same individual said that his brigade detects 70 to 90 FPV drones a day, but can't bring them all down. They haven't got the, the, the means to do so. And that Russian forces sometimes equip drones with munitions that can detonate after Ukrainian forces down them. Uh, I, was, I dialed into a Zoom the other day with Jack Watling from uh, Rusi. He was in the States, but he, he did, a, did a thing. And he was talking about drones and saying how the how the sort of golden, uh, the envelope for a drone these days is to be outside of, of small arms fire from the ground, um, but that can still uh, carry out its task, either surveillance, reconnaissance, or to drop munitions, or to be a, or to be a kamikaze drone, one-way attack drone. He said those, the kind of thing like an all antenna, the Russian all antenna fits into this bracket, says that's the optimum for these drones so that they are, so you've got to use a bigger missile, of which, you know, we've spoken at length about how there are a few of those around at the moment, to bring them down. If you can't hit them from the ground, if you can't see them or hear them, and, or even if you can, but you can't hit them, and I, you know, try to keep going back a bit now, but I probably, a shoulder launch, you know, a rifle, a soldier trying to fire, you've got to be at, what 500 feet if you're above 500 certainly if you're above a thousand feet you're you're pretty safe i would think um and therefore that kind of drone is a bit bigger so you're talking the tens of thousands as opposed to the sort of three four five thousand dollars per unit so a bit more expensive but russia seems to be having the advantage in that bracket now then i mentioned roman kostenko a moment ago uh david the mobilization bill that he sponsored through Ukraine's parliament was signed off by the country's speaker, the parliament, parliamentary speaker this morning, Ruslan Stefanchuk. It's now on the desk of President Zelensky waiting his signature. This bill allows military recruitment offices to sue people who evade mandatory conscription, allows for tougher punishments for anyone ignoring their draft summons. And it calls for men, calls for all men of fighting age, which was recently decreased from 27 to 25, calls for all men in that bracket to to show up for medical examinations and renew their data in local conscription offices. Ukrainian men living abroad also have to update their contact number and address online. So a big clamp down here on who's available for the draft. Now, very controversially, the Ukrainian parliament chose not to include in the bill a clause allowing soldiers to return home after three years of service which had been the standard policy before the full-scale invasion. Now, that decision has drawn a lot of heat. As you can imagine, soldiers on the front line who have basically no end to their service, with leave periods being a bit ad hoc and certainly nothing particularly well established, that has not gone down very well indeed. It gives you an idea of the of the very difficult choices that Ukraine is having to make at the moment about mobilising it, its citizenry. Now then, uh, a couple more. The drone attacks against Zaporizhia nuclear power plant on April the 7th and 9th 
were part of what's been described as a well-planned false flag operation by the Russian Federation. This comes from Ukraine's permanent representative to the UN, Sergei Kizlets- uh, Kizlitsia. He was speaking at the UN Security Council meeting yesterday. You'll remember the nuclear power plant um, that's been occupied by Russia since uh, March, March 22, I think, suffered at least three direct strikes on April the 7th and another drone attack uh, a couple of days later hit the plant's nearby training centre. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, called the strikes a major escalation. So the Security Council were convened yesterday to discuss safety and security at the plant. This is Europe's largest nuclear facility. Um, and during that meeting, uh, Kislitz here, Mr. Kislitz here said blame for the attacks and increased risks at the facility lies firmly with the Russian invasion and occupation. He said what happened at the ZMPP on the 7th and 9th of April and thereafter was a well-planned false flag operation by the Russian Federation. He went on to accuse Russia of launching a disinformation and propaganda campaign aimed at justifying Moscow's illegal occupation of the plant. Now, responding to Russian claims that Ukrainian drones carried out the April attacks, Mr. Kizlitsia said, we categorically reject the insane allegations that Ukraine may cause nuclear disaster. Now, while the IAEA announced on April the 13th that all six of the plant's reactors had been moved into a state of cold shutdown, head of the agency, Rafael Grossi, he said the, he warned the Security Council that the potential for disaster is still high. He said, we are getting dangerously close to a nuclear accident. I mean, words you should not take lightly. Um, he, he didn't attribute blame for the attacks, and continued his calls, as he has done in the past, for an immediate end to uh, reckless attacks. But he did say, we cannot sit by and watch as the final weight tips the finely balanced scale. I mean, pretty pretty dramatic stuff there. And then just finally, David, the chief of the Estonian general staff, Major General Enno Motz, says Russia is pushing hard to exploit the Ukrainian military's current material shortages, not only to achieve tactical success, but also to drive a wedge in Western support or drive a wedge in the idea of Western support. So in an interview published on Sunday, General Motz emphasised Russia does not care about manpower or material losses and said Russia's attempts to exploit vulnerabilities on the front line, which he somewhat curiously but colourfully described as amoeba tactics, along with Russia's escalation of deep strikes throughout Ukraine, are aimed at exploiting the current supply shortages. The ISW, Institute for the Study of War, US-based think tank, suggests US failures to provide timely and consistent military aid to Ukraine, which they say only the US can provide at scale, could have a negative ripple effect on Ukraine's international partners globally, which, combined with persistent Russian information operations, are aimed at convincing Western policymakers, and I would add society at large, that Russia can and will outlast Western military assistance to Ukraine. So all a bit gloomy, David, but I'm afraid that's it and we're up to date for today. Well, thank you very much, Dom, for all of those updates. Francis, with your uh, reporting, let's first go to the United States. Francis Sternley. Thanks, David. Well, breakthrough in Washington with the Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Mike Johnson, announcing that he will at last hold a vote on aid for Ukraine and Israel this week in a move that could, I emphasise that word again, resolve the months-long logjam in Congress. We speculated yesterday that the events in Israel might spark this, and so it has proved. In the end, the decision by the White House to combine support for Israel and Ukraine in the same military aid package has paid off, as it has now forced the issue to be confronted. However, crucially, Johnson said the package would differ from the $95 billion supplemental proposed by Joe Biden, which has already been agreed by the Senate. As he left a closed door meeting of Republicans on Capitol Hill last night, Johnson said he would hold four separate votes in the House, allowing congressmen to vote for support some countries and not others. One vote will focus on US aid for Ukraine, which of course has stalled in recent months after Congress refused to renew Biden's mandate to send American munitions to Kyiv. A second will deal with support for Israel, which has now been attached to the Ukraine funding in the White House's own package. A third 
could authorize support for Taiwan, where the Biden administration has said it was concerned about Chinese military buildup and other allies. And a fourth will address other measures that are popular with Republicans and has been mooted as a way to sweeten the package for critics. Speaking after that meeting, Johnson said the overall concept of his plan was the same as Biden's package. Quote, it's the same places that the funding would be sent and you'll see the House's take on it. As listeners will know, some Republicans have signalled that they will not vote for a compromise package between the GOP-controlled House and the White House. Johnson has already faced a rebellion from some hardliners led by the uh, vocal Marjorie Taylor Greene. Some have called for him to be ousted from the Speaker's chair just months after Kevin McCarthy was removed by a similar rebellion in October. Obviously, that news is the most important of the day in the political sphere, one we will be watching now very, very closely over the coming days. Crucially, though, will Ukraine get that aid? When we recorded the special at the US Embassy here in London a few weeks back, just before our Ukraine trip, it was noteworthy, I think, the mood then was fairly upbeat that when this bill was put to the House of Representatives, that it would pass. But I don't know if the mood music is quite the same now. So whilst this is, of course, promising because we're going to get some decision at last, some break of that logjam, at the same time, I don't think we can say this is an absolute guarantee that Ukraine is going to get an aid package passed. So one for us to monitor very, very closely, as I say. I know that the Ukraine Action Summit, a coalition of American pro-Ukraine groups, organised for some 400 voters to meet with their state representatives on the capital in order to petition uh, on behalf of Ukraine yesterday and today. We shouldn't underestimate the importance of such moves, as I can attest from my time working in Parliament here in London, sometimes hearing from one impassioned constituents can make a world of difference in how that member of parliament approaches an issue. We'll all be watching the outcome with bated breath, suffice to say, although as we previously discussed, that bill in Congress for Ukraine, if it passes, is not a silver bullet. At best, it will sustain Ukraine for a while, but it will not prove decisive in changing the strategic trajectory. Yet we mustn't forget the talismanic quality the bill has taken on. It is a symbol now. As Democratic House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffrey put it, this week is a Churchill or Chamberlain moment. So stick with Ukraine the latest. We'll be following it. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for bringing us that. We'll certainly get Tony Diver uh, and hopefully Rosina Sabor in Washington on over the next few days to talk us through developments on the US aid bill as it goes through Congress. Um, but Francis, there are other updates outside the US you want to talk us through as well. Francis Dunley. Sure, I'll be as brief as I can, but a lot is going on. So we spoke yesterday at length about the implications of many Western and non-Western nations coming to Israel's aid over the weekend to destroy incoming drones and missiles fired from Iran and why it was done for that country and not another, namely Ukraine, particularly when, of course, you hear Western countries consistently saying that Ukraine is as vital an ally for world security. Well, this has been now put to the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, who said rather predictably that it would lead to, do you want to guess the term he used? Dangerous escalation. Speaking live on LBC Radio, Cameron said that the Royal Air Force could not defend Ukrainian airspace in the same way as the one thing that needs to be avoided is NATO troops directly engaging with Russian troops. Ukraine should be provided with support in terms of money and crucially in terms of weapons, he said. But actually putting NATO forces directly in conflict with Russian forces, I think that would be a dangerous escalation. When asked why the West couldn't give Ukraine more direct help in shooting down drones, Cameron responded that what Ukraine needs right now is not Western planes over their skies. What they desperately want and what we need to give them is more air defence systems, which are more effective. Somehow, I don't think the Ukrainians would turn down the offer of Western pilots defending their airspace, especially if they were just shooting down drones and missiles. But anyway, I think quite a revealing insight there from Lord Cameron. Turning to other news, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has met with President Xi of China in Beijing today and said before that meeting, he was planning to discuss how we can contribute more to a just peace in Ukraine. 
He said the invasion was one of many topics to discuss in the meeting on as part of his three-day visit to China. The Chinese state-run news agency said she and Schultz had an in-depth exchange of views and that she proposed four principles to resolve the war. They included refraining from selfish gains, working to cool down the situation and not add fuel to the fire, creating conditions for the restoration of peace and reducing the negative impact on the world economy. According to Deutsche Welle, Schultz's plan described the talks as good, but not did not provide further details. We spoke a lot about China's evolving role yesterday. So if you're interested in that subject, I recommend listening to that episode. Whatever China says publicly, we know that their proposals for peace are a long, long way from what Ukraine would want. The Chinese Communist Party is committed to peace only to the extent that it continues to advance its own goals, which of course, includes its own expansion in the long run, as itself has stated. But in the short term, they don't want to see an economic decoupling from the West, and neither does the West, given our own dependencies. Whether that is an error or enlightened will be for historians to judge. But turning to the energy front, as we've reported recently, there are real concerns about certain Ukrainian cities being without power as a result of Russia strikes on infrastructure. We learned today that the EU Energy Commissioner, Kadri Simpson, supports Ukraine's proposal to increase its capacity for electricity imports from the EU, specifically from, it's a bit of a mouthful this, so bear with me, European Network of Transmission System Operators for Electricity. <sighs> The Russians want to achieve a complete blackout of Ukraine, the Ukrainian representative told EU ministers. Therefore, it is very important to consolidate our efforts in order to resist Russian aggression next winter. We'll have to watch the implications of this. It is worth remembering that Moscow has not been successful in its objective of knocking out nationwide energy infrastructure, in part thanks to improvements in the defence systems gifted by Western nations compared to in the first year of the war. If that hadn't happened, who knows where we would be now? And lastly, it's been a while since we've discussed everyone's favourite subject, the Black Sea Grain Deal. Reuters have published a really fascinating exclusive into the latest machinations on this, which says that Russia and Ukraine negotiated for two months this year with Turkey on a deal to ensure the safety of shipping in the Black Sea and indeed reached an agreement on a text that would be announced by Ankara before Kyiv suddenly pulled out. This is coming from four people familiar with the matter. The negotiations were mediated by Turkey after nudging by the UN and a deal was reached that would allegedly, quote, ensure the safety of merchant shipping in the Black Sea, close quote, with Kyiv giving its assent for Turkish President Erdogan to announce it on March 30th, the day before critical regional elections. Then, at the very last minute, Ukraine suddenly pulled out and the deal was scuttled. It's not immediately clear why, says Reuters, speaking to these sources. One possible reason we were mooting this morning is that Kyiv has had several highly successful operations in the Black Sea in recent weeks. So perhaps they felt they didn't require such a deal any longer. Maybe they felt it would look like a concession to Moscow in one of the few areas where they've been operationally successful. We just don't know. That's just speculation on our part. But a very interesting development nonetheless, and one to follow, I think. So a lot happening, David. But as I say, Washington is the key arena, I think, now this week. We'll be watching it very closely. So do stick with Ukraine the latest. Coming up, Dom and Francis share their final thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Francis Durley. Let's move then to our final thoughts. Dom Nichols, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So I've been looking at um, an interesting article that went up online uh, last night from The Economist. They've had an interview with Ukraine's new National Security and Defence Council Secretary, Alexander Litvinenko, the chap who before this was uh, in charge of uh, Ukraine's Foreign Intelligence Service, the kind of SIS slash MI6 CIA equivalent. Um, he was talking about, he said, Putin is addicted to the idea of conquering Ukraine and will not give up his aims of completely seizing the country and destroying the state. Um, 
I say it's up on online now. He poured scorn on those who say Ukraine should cede territory to Russia in return for peace, saying that would be a cruel betrayal of the Ukrainians left under violent occupation. He said Putin has lied, is lying and will continue to lie. Uh, it's crucial to understand this is him speaking. It's crucial to understand that Putinism has not yet completed its evolution. It could get even worse if the West does not stop this. It will end up paying more later and with its own lives, assisting Ukraine isn't about charity. The next time, talking about if there was a ceasefire and you know if people believed there'd be a ceasefire, um, Mr. Litvinenko said, no, no way, Putin will come back later. And he said the next time he won't make mistakes, but will prepare his operation much more carefully according to all the laws of military art. Now, I briefly met Mr. Litvinenko back in February before he was appointed uh, to his uh, the current position, National Security and Defence Council Secretary. And he said Putin's motivation is not money, not power, but greatness. That was what he said to me. But he then went on to say that the problem Putin has is that Russia is not great enough to destroy Ukraine. And hence, we are where we are. But an interesting article there, first article with the first interview with a new chap. We're hoping to speak to him as well, speak to him again. But uh, yeah, well worth a look, David. Thank you very much, Dom. Francis Sternley, to finish this episode. Well, thanks, David. For those in need of a laugh, the other day I came into the studio only to be confronted with Dom and yourself wearing the exact same outfit. A sign we spend too much time together, I think. It was, what was it, a blue shirt? Natty blue shirt. Natty blue shirt. Yellowish. Dark blue shirt, Francis. Dark blue shirt. I, whatever it was, I would argue it was a sartorial monstrosity. And I've posted this image on my Twitter account and there is now a poll up which is who wore it better. I believe, uh, as of half an hour ago, that Dom, or should I say Team Onions, is on 62%. 68 now. 68%. And Team Scraggly Beard, Mr. Knowles, is on 30... Well, you do the maths. Go on. Oh my God, there's smoke coming out of his ears. Oh, bloody hell. Uh, 100 like, minus 68. No, I'm not doing it, Dom, because you'll catch me out by 1% one one and then it'll be humiliation forever. So, look, you... you answers on the back of a postcard if you want to vote then it's on my twitter and we can announce the victor later in the week just to make the point of course that these 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 polls are inherently biased we shouldn't put anything by them uh, run as they are uh, on dom's account so you know all listeners uh, just you know we've talked a lot about uh, election and uh, democratic integrity on this podcast so i just want to flag that you know off the bat as I say, I was not particularly impressed by either outfit. So actually, I think the question who wore it better is itself a false one. But anyway, so uh, I think we could all do with a little bit of uh, light relief at the moment. So uh, do check it out. I'll put a link in the description. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.com co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest or sign up to Dispatches a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox we also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast you can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter spaces follow the Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it to our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.